Historically, immigrants have had to adapt to find a taste of home. When my mother lived in Germany in the 80s, she used to boil jalapenos in water because it was the closest she could get to the taste of kimchi stew. Sometimes, out of necessity, this melding of different cultures produces something entirely new and delicious. Growing up with a Korean mom and a white dad, my kitchen table was always a mashup of East and West. So when I heard about the concept of this show, to investigate the meaning of fusion and the impact of migration on culinary tradition, I knew I had to start with Korean food just because it's a cuisine that's so close to me. Poja 32 in Manhattan's Koreatown serves a dish called Budejige, also known as army-based stew, that marries a Korean staple with Western ingredients. It's a dish that was born in a time of scarcity. In the aftermath of the Korean War, when Koreans began incorporating canned foods from American military bases. This kind of processed food was very new to Koreans in the old days. Spam or mm -hmm. canned food. Right after the Korean War is finished, everybody was poor. Mm -hmm. And then around that time, you know, some people who work in the army base brought home this processed kind of canned spam and ham and sausage. And then they added it to the kimchi stew and it tasted so tasty. Even just visually is like a complete mashup of Korean and American ingredients. When I was really young, I didn't know that this is puri chige. Mm -hmm. You know, like my mom would make kimchi chige and then sometimes she'll throw in some ramen noodles, she'll throw in some sausages, some spam, and then it was later when people were like, oh, your mom's making puri chige, and I'm like, oh. My memory was mainly just, oh, it's kimchi chige with a lot of different ingredients. Well, when I lived in Korea, I was not a big fan of, you know, this kind of budejjigae because just the concept of this food, the adding sausage and ham, you know, <laughs> and cheese, kind of, I didn't like that kind of idea. Traditional army-based stew is you need the kimchi. Mm. First one, kimchi, you cannot skip it, mm. and also spam. When I came to America and I lived in also Canada, everybody says, what? Koreans used to eat the spam, so I didn't realize that mm -hmm. this is very, people look down, upon people look down on this kind of you know, spam. What I read was that the GIs had what they called sea rations, mm -hmm. and they were eating spam like three times a day. Mm -hmm. So back in America, there was a sort of backlash of just like, spam is disgusting, we've eaten it so much when we were in the military. Um, but in Korea, people were on the brink of starvation, it was a war-torn country, agriculture was at a standstill. Um, they were scavenging, a lot of people were scavenging uh, near army bases for the spam, so there's also like a very kind of painful history in this dish too. More and more people love this budejjigae among Koreans, but somebody who went through so poverty at the time, mm -hmm. probably they would think, oh, wow, these days young people are eating this way, but actually I was crying at the time, mm -hmm. no food in Korea at the time. Most of the young generation don't think this way, just enjoy this food. Yeah. And also ingredients are now just, uh, you know, improved. Mm -hmm. Better quality, mm -hmm. they add more, you know, rice cake here, you know, tofu, sweet potato even, and noodles. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. make it more kind of uh, upscale. But only one thing you cannot miss is kimchi. <laughs> so because it is based on kimchi stew. I think that Korean people have like a really interesting relationship to fusion. A lot of Western ingredients, maybe because of this beginning of the history there, are becoming incorporated in new ways and it's actually become more and more popular. So people are sort of attracted to fusion in the way that they kind of have this distaste for that here. These days in Korea, a lot of people, we can't say, hey, you know, you are Korean, you are supposed to eat only authentic food. Why kimchi jjigae, no budae jjigae? <laughs> you can't say that because mm -hmm. people love it. And maybe we can talk about, hey, more health conscious, mm -hmm. don't need too much processed food. We can talk about this, mm -hmm. but this is not a Korean food. You are not supposed to eat this. You know? <laughs> yeah. We should, you know, get out of that kind of a concept. A lot of the chefs that I have talked to about their uh, different types of cuisine are very hesitant about the word fusion. And I think that it kind of has this sort of negative connotation here. For me personally, when I hear of like an Asian fusion restaurant, I, I generally like kind of like turn my nose up a little bit because I just assume it's like inauthentic and bad. I think that, you know, fusion for me, when I liked to add 
sriracha to just a turkey sandwich, or you know, I eat kimchi with pasta mm-hmm. a lot. So is that really fusion? For me, more than a trend, I think it used to be more trendy, like, oh, let's combine this and this and it works. But I think that people love combining different things just, you know, because it just tastes good. It's interesting to think about, like, the difference between fusion and evolution. Now that there's such a larger Korean-American population here, do you feel like Korean food has changed to sort of Western taste a little bit? Just around me, everybody makes authentic food. Mm -hmm. But when I go to the restaurant, you know, just like your restaurant, you know, just maybe they can change because they have to be creative Mm -hmm. to bring that some more people. If this is too authentic way, it's too spicy, too too fishy, they probably calm down the heat. Mm -hmm. Uh, I understand. One dish that I could think of that is from here that made it back to Korea and kind of came back Mm -hmm. is uh, Korean fried chicken. When you go to Korean restaurants, I don't know if it's really always the right thing to say, like, oh, this is very traditional Korean fried chicken. Because, you know, <laughs> right, we're, like, right, right. you know, is that really authentic? Well, like, say, it's hard to, yeah, you know? It's like saying that, you know, this is really authentic buddha jjigae because it's yeah. like, you know, Korean fried chicken, I think, mm-hmm. similarly, is also after the Korean War, probably, was yeah. also a Western influence. My, my mom passed away in, in 2014, almost five years ago now. And actually, the first dish that I made um, was chachu because, and I actually followed your recipe, that's how I found you. There are a lot of people who learn how to cook Korean food yeah, because yeah. of you. They all kind of have this like surrogate digital mom. It's a very like personal thing, this food and learning how to pass that down, even if it's not from your family, but someone else. Mm-hmm. That's why I think it kind of feels like so close to you because there's this familial feeling of, I learned how to cook this partially from this person. How do you feel when people who aren't Korean who are interested in Korean food as like a fat? Like there was a video about this white guy making kimchi and a lot of people were like, this guy is just so confident in really not showing how to make it correctly. As someone who makes videos from a really kind of authentic place, how do you feel when you see something like that? I mean, in the old days, when I started uh, uh, posting my uh, recipe for the first time, I was very annoyed. You know, for example, one chef came and then just uh, cut it whole Napa cabbage with a big knife to cut it like this. We don't do this. Always be nice to my ingredients. They're your babies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then when I saw this, I was very, you know, some little bit annoyed. But these days it's okay, mm-hmm. you know, because uh, all culture is different. Mm-hmm. Whatever you make, you know, you think that that's a kimchi. Mm-hmm. Okay. If you taste, <laughs> if this is tasty, that's your kimchi. Yeah. So. I think, you know, for me, no problem. I always put myself into other people's position. If I want to learn Indian cooking, I want to learn real, authentic way. After that, okay, I, this is a too strong flavor. I can calm down, and that's my choice. Mm-hmm. But first, I want to learn real one, real one. What kind of questions I'm searching for the answer to also is, what is the distinction between cultural sharing and cultural appropriation? As a Korean business owner, serving food that has a very, very close personal connection to you, does it bother you to see financial success of non-Korean people using that cuisine as like a popular thing? When we introduced our concept, the neighborhood and in the community, they were very open, which we're very grateful for. I'm not always there, so I don't know if the customers really know that this is owned by a Korean American. Mm-hmm. They just think, oh, is this like part of Whole Foods? We get that question a lot, like, yeah. oh, did Whole Foods create this concept? So when we talk and share about our story and why we're doing this, it's really to share the Korean authentic flavors, but just kind of reinterpret it in our way. Do you ever worry, I mean, in the same way that we talked about Buddha Jjigae and the history behind it, and this kind of fear that people think that this is authentic, traditional Korean food, do you feel this like responsibility to tell people like this is an addition? No, I mean, we love the traditional uh, Korean soups and the proteins that our moms make, but at the same time, like, this is actually a lot of how Korean Americans eat. So I think, um, and also, yeah. do you ever feel just like, well, I'm Korean and I yeah. eat this, so it's authentic to me? Yeah. It irritates me a little bit more than I think like a slightly older generation. For me, and I, I wonder if you felt this way too growing up in the US, when I would bring kimchi to school, I got really made 
fun of. And it was a really like painful thing in my childhood uh, to be made fun of. I was so self-conscious about it. Part of me is like very, very happy that Korean food is becoming more popular, that more people are exposed to it. But there's also like a little bit of resentment and irritation that it had to be sent around by like other, you know, American people. Right. What you have, you have like a different memory mm. that growing up mm. and you're like now everybody loves it. You know, right. why yeah. didn't they well, like well, it yeah, 20 yeah, years yeah, ago? Yeah, yeah, Where exactly. were you like yeah. 10, 15 years mm. ago? Um, yeah, I, I grew up very, I have similar stories and I think at one point I avoided trying to bring that Korean lunch to school mm -hmm. and sometimes I would just not eat. But I think that in general, people have changed the way they eat. They're introduced to so many more different flavors. Like, you know, sushi is like a very popular example too. It took some time, but now that there's more access, there's better marketing, there's, you know, more non-Koreans trying to create their own version of what it means to them and to share that part of their story that now it's like, okay, I could eat it, you can eat it too. I think my memory is it's comfort food at home. My mom was a working mom and this was like the fastest thing she could make. This had kind of all the food groups and bowl of hot rice. You didn't need the 10 different panchan side dishes. So I think this is a very good thing about Korean food. Mm -hmm. You can change, change the ingredients to something that you available.